Welcome everyone to the 42nd Hands-On Agile Meetup. Today we have uh, the wonderful uh, Jana Basta with us. She's the CEO and co-founder of ProtPad and one of the essential applications that helps us creating products that our customers love. And she will be talking about uh, lean road mapping and um, OKRs. And I'm really curious about that. Wonderful, thank you so much for the uh, warm intro. Really glad to get a chance to uh, chat with you today. So I'm going to be talking about lean road mapping and OKRs, as you said, uh, and talking about how uh, you know practical tips about how to move away from old school feature and date driven roadmaps and how to move your team to leaner, more objective focused track of product management using OKRs. I'm going to dive into more than that as well with some real life stories about how we've done it and what's worked and what hasn't worked as well. To give you a little bit more background, I'm a product person at heart. I was a product manager before I started ProdPad. You might know me as one of the founders of Mind the Product, which is the global community of product people. Or, of course, as one of the founders and the CEO of ProdPad, which is the road mapping, product strategy, discovery, and feedback tool, and it's used by thousands of teams around the world. And as I said, I've got a background as a product person, so along the way, I've done a ton of mentoring, training, and consulting in the product space. So I've just had the chance to chat to literally thousands of product people over the years about how they do product management, how they do roadmaps, OKRs, um, and what works and what doesn't work. And I want to start off by talking about a myth that I've come across so often. So I want to dispel it first thing today. When you think about a product manager, a lot of the time you think about a roadmap as the work they do as if it's their main output. But surely we know that not to be true. A roadmap is simply one product, many things that a, a product manager produces in their day-to-day -day work amongst all that discovery and stakeholder communication and prioritization and backlog nurturing work that, that we do. But roadmaps are highly contentious and easy to center on. You know, ask any product manager how they do the roadmaps today, and it's sure to kick off all sorts of colorful discussion about what a roadmap itself is and what the best way to communicate a roadmap might be. And I actually used to have really bad roadmap habits. Now, this is a, an actual example of one of my old roadmaps from years ago, where I faithfully reproduced the feature wish list of our company into a timeline roadmap that I could present to our team and to our board. Now, you might think that this is a, an extreme example, or just one example, a standalone, but this is exactly what you see when you look for roadmap templates, even today. Now, this is from a Google image search result for product roadmap. This is what you find when you look up product roadmap templates. And that's a lot of feature and date-driven timeline roadmaps. You know, so this and my research into how thousands of product people do their roadmaps shows that this is really how people still do their roadmaps today. Now, I have a bit of a confession to make because this is actually partly my fault. You see, back when I used to do my roadmap like this, I wanted to be helpful. So I wrapped it up into this tidy Excel template and I published it onto the, the newly minted Mind the Product blog back in 2011. And even though I've now updated the post with a great big caveat and a warning not to use this format for road mapping, I see it popping up all over the place. So this might partly be my fault, but it's also the fault of the people we work for. Our bosses and execs who ask product people to make roadmaps full of features and dates and promises and put pressure on us to deliver as if we can absolve them from the bad decisions that they've made about the business model and the resources that they've created and provided for us. And when the roadmap fails, it looks bad on the product manager, but it's usually not the product manager who has a say in what goes into those failing roadmaps in the first place. You know, no wonder that a product manager was once called one of the unhappiest jobs in America. So what's going on in these failing roadmaps? I mean, this is how a lot of roadmaps look today. Now, I know this format makes you look great today. Your board and your bosses certainly love when you can give them this level of certainty, but it's setting you up for failure. See, if you deconstruct this format of the roadmap, you basically get a chart that maps out time versus things to do. You have time on the x-axis and it creates this timeline. And at first, it seems pretty easy and intuitive to use, particularly in the short term, but the further out you plan and the more you put on there, the harder it becomes to manage. And because that timeline always sits at the top, 
always marching forward. No matter what you put on the roadmap, everything always includes a due date and a time estimate just by the format of this roadmap. And as a result, you end up with a big pile of features and a big pile of due dates. And it's all based on this big pile of assumptions. So the first assumption you've made with this format is that you know how long each of these is gonna take. Now this might be easy for the stuff that you've broken down into more detail and had the developers give some estimates on, but the further down the list you go, the less clarity you've actually got. And you're also assuming that nothing else is gonna come in to mess up your timeline. No new changes in the market, no new competitors, no fresh ideas coming from customers, no need for iteration. And you're also assuming that each of these features will work as soon as they launch. So if you put three weeks to build that new checkout page, then at the end of those three weeks, it'll be converting exactly as well as expected and you're free to move on to the next thing. And by explicitly adding these features to the timeline, you're assuming that each of these features should definitely exist, that they form part of the strategy and therefore should be codified. And so what could go wrong? Well, you end up creating these made up release dates, which force your developers on these stressful marches to launch on time. And you give your sales and customers expectations that you can't meet. Well, usually being blind to great opportunities in the market and downright building the wrong things. And this leads to you being a sad product manager. And worse, it creates a vicious cycle that can be hard to get out of. So, no one wants to get caught holding the hot potato, missing a deadline. And so bigger and bigger buffers are given. And then work expands to fill the time that was given in those buffers. And what you end up with is what's called Parkinson's law. It's the reason that you always seem to be running up against due dates, no matter how far out they started. You know, scope always creeps and work always expands to fill the time that you've given for something. There's always something new to do in there. So these longer estimations create these longer, riskier looking timelines that the execs look at and they become even less comfortable giving you any freedom to work in a lean way. So they try to tie down even tighter due dates so that they feel like they've got this control on the costs. And so there's never any room for discovery in there. There's no room for rework or building in quality. The wrong things end up getting built, problems aren't solved and quality just suffers. And it ends up leading to blame culture where no one feels safe being the one to take a misstep at work. You know, people just end up resorting to giving bigger and bigger buffers and estimates for their work in the hopes that they're not the one to ever get it wrong again because last time they got in trouble for it. And like blame culture is the opposite of psychological safety. So is there a better way? <laughs> well, of course there is. This is where lean road mapping comes into play. Now, lean is all about the build, measure, learn cycle. And the key bit here is about the learn part, right? It's essential to the benefits of lean. Now, learning quickly with as little cost as possible in order to reduce wastage and eliminate any unnecessary risk. And so this is where your roadmap comes in. Your roadmap is a tool that helps you learn and iterate at the product strategy level. Or put more succinctly, your roadmap is a prototype for your strategy. Let me show you in more concrete ways of looking at this. When you go to build a new feature, you don't run straight in with a fully designed interface that you put together from scratch. You often start with some basic sketches on a piece of paper or you know, whiteboard or something like that. You take that sketch and you show it to a colleague or a customer, and then they give you some feedback on it. You know, Maybe they say, move that button here to make it more clear, or add some copy there and I'd understand it. And you throw out that first sketch and you make a slightly better one. You take on board the feedback that you learned from those early customers and you repeat until you're reasonably sure that you understand how that interface, how that feature is gonna solve the problems at hand. Right? Well, your first roadmap can be similar. You know, honestly, if each of you walked out of here and started your first roadmap like this, you know, in colorful crayons, I'd be proud. Like, it shouldn't be pretty. It shouldn't be slick. What you're really doing is saying, as a product person, I've listened to the stakeholders around me. I've heard a series of problems and opportunities, and I've interpreted it as this. I think it means we should tackle this, and then this, and then this. What do you think? And then you take these assumptions that you're making to a colleague and you check their opinion before you commit too much to it. And if you agree, if they agree, you're on the right track, right? Check it with somebody else and keep moving down that path. 
if they point out holes in the plan, then you can start making adjustments. Maybe you'd need to add in a new problem that you hadn't thought to capture, or you need to change the order of some of those problems, or maybe you'd outline something as a problem, which isn't actually a big deal and can be removed altogether. You know, here's a slightly more practical example. It's a starting point of a road mapping session that I did in Miro. Again, you're not looking for pretty. You're looking to lay out your assumptions and to get your colleagues to do the same so you can check your assumptions against each other. You know, ultimately, this is going to lead you to a stronger, more cohesive strategy that actually solves key problems for the business and has fewer blind spots than trying to build the perfect roadmap, the most beautiful roadmap out of the gate. Now, there's another tactic here that I want to bring to you, which is this concept. Now, I really want you to keep your roadmap simple. And this concept is called roadmap bankruptcy, because a lot of us have adopted roadmaps that simply aren't simple, right? You've moved into this new company and you've got, frankly speaking, a junk roadmap. It's filled with somebody else's assumptions and a whole bunch of other stuff that was thought up in the previous months and years. Well, declare roadmap bankruptcy. Go push it all to the side tomorrow and start with fresh eyes. Throw out the old roadmap and start again. And what you're doing is you're just pushing it to the side. It's only when you've gone through the process of recreating and checking your assumptions with colleagues about what should be on there, should you go back and compare to that old roadmap. And you might actually find that there's a bunch of stuff that isn't actually on the new roadmap because it never came up as a problem. Maybe it never was a problem. Maybe that problem died a couple of years ago with the old roadmap. You know, that's actually a whole bunch of unnecessary work that you just avoided for you and your team. You wrote it off, and that's actually really great work. There's nothing more lean than that. So don't be afraid to reset, to declare roadmap bankruptcy, particularly if you've got this really bloated roadmap that's just full of someone else's assumptions that you haven't checked. And the one thing that I always tell product people, and it bears repeating for an exercise like this, is that it's not your job to have all the answers. As product people, you're supposed to know less than your colleagues. They're the experts of their domain, whether it's of the tech, the market, the customer-facing challenges, or whatever. Your job as a product person is to surround yourself with these experts and then to ask the best questions, to tease out the expertise, to help the team make the best product decisions based on what you all collectively know. Guiding on a solid road mapping process is one of the most impactful things you can do to set a solid company strategy if you let the expertise of your team shine through. The last thing you want to do is be the product person who sets the product roadmap yourself and doesn't use the collective knowledge of your team. And remember when I said that lean was a way to de-risk your business? By working your roadmap in a really lean way, you're checking assumptions about future problems way in advance. Just like when you prototype an interface or a feature, you're learning really early on. So if you and your colleague run into a conversation where you disagree on what order to tackle a series of problems or whether or not a problem even exists, it's really good you had that conversation today, right now, rather than committing a whole bunch of brain space to it, or worse, a bunch of code to it down the line, just because it was on the roadmap and no one dared to question it. You're preventing wastage and de-risking your business. You're saving tons of time, not trying to craft the most perfect, most beautiful roadmap. You are working on the most interesting strategy that actually solves the problems based on what your colleagues know. Now, one fundamental thing to remember is that product is a big unknown. You're building into uncharted territory. There's no blueprint to follow. There's no right way to do this. It's not like building a prefab house, you know, which is really like gathering the materials and putting it all together in a series of precise steps. It's more like landing on a new unknown shore and knowing that you have to get to the big gold topped mountain in the distance and having to pick out the best path along the way. You've got certain resources with you now, and you'll pick up more resources and knowledge along the way. It's up to you and your team to survey your surroundings and decide what you have at your disposal and what problems you need to solve as you go. So every product is a unique journey. And this is where the concept of horizons come in. You're standing here at the present time, or what we'd call now, and you can see what's keeping your team busy right now, or what problems are right in front of you. And it's like if you landed on this new shore and immediately saw that there was a bear right in front of you, like that's your first problem to solve. It's crystal clear. Uh, and unless somebody sees a, a different, bigger problem, like a big fire or a big wolf or whatever, you better start thinking of ways to solve that particular problem. And you can also see way off into the distance, you know, that mountaintop that you aspire to conquer. 
you know, there are probably problems to solve there. You know, maybe something to do with keeping warm or, or ice climbing gear that you have to procure. But that's too specific right now. And you can figure that out when you get closer. You're a long way off and there's lots of things you can do before you get there to, to gather resources and knowledge along the way. But if there are known chunky problems like get up the mountain, it's worth noting them down. And this way you and your team can keep an eye out for ways to break them down and solve them over the course of the months and the years, the journey ahead. And you can also see off into the middle distance in various directions and to various levels of degrees. Now, how well depends on how well equipped and what your starting position is right now, like how well equipped your team is. Now, you might spot opportunities that you can take advantage of that'll help you along the way to reach those ultimate goals or problems that you need to overcome or avoid. Like maybe there's a glistening city full of money and resources that you could reach, or maybe there's a bog that you need to get over. And there are probably multiple paths you could take through this journey. And from where you're standing, you don't really know which is the best one. You know, after all, the further things are in the distance, the less certain you are about them. It might be faster to build the bridge, but it means you'll miss the uplift in resources you get from visiting the city. But from here, you know, maybe it's just a mirage in the desert anyways. You know, unfortunately, you can't just whip out your phone and pull up a Google Maps or something like that. You know, this is uncharted territory. There is no right answer. But some answers will be better than others. And the best answers will come from teams who lay out what they see on the road ahead and regularly regroup to make sure that they're still on the best path. So these horizons translate to a product roadmap. So instead of a timeline, which is a single date-driven line marching forwards, think in terms of these three buckets. In the first bucket, the now, you're granular about your focus and your scope. This is the stuff right in front of you that's being discovered, prototyped, tested, and built right now. And the later column is much less about specific initiatives and more around outlining the problems that you think need to be solved in order to fulfill your vision. Now, if you're setting off on a journey like this, you can imagine a team might immediately start bickering. And this is because they haven't yet agreed on what they're trying to achieve. You know, they all know that they want to reach the summit, but they have no framework for measuring their success. Therefore, you know, to know whether they're actually working on the right things. After all, if you've got no way of saying whether you're working on the right things, who's to say you're actually working on the wrong thing or not? Road mapping without objectives can just be chaos. So this is where setting objectives comes in. Now, OKRs stands for Objectives and Key Results. And we're going to dive into this in a lot more detail. I just want to clear the air about one thing, which is that some of you might have KPIs or key performance indicators instead, or something else that you call them, right? Now, you could split hairs and go down rabbit holes talking about the difference between KPIs and OKRs. Now, the thing is, when KPIs were first used, they filled a spot much like OKRs do. They gave people in the team direction and a shared vocabulary around how they're measured. Now, over the years, companies have gotten sloppy with how they use KPIs, and they've ended up becoming more of a corporate joke than a useful tool. Now, OKRs have great intentions too, but can be misused, and in several years, might have a bad name for themselves too. You know, give it a few years, there will probably be some new cool acronym floating about doing the same jobs that these tools were meant to do, right? OKRs and KPIs will be out and some new thing will be in. So don't get caught up in the names that I'm using today. It's a fad of this decade, but just remember to take on board the purpose of what OKRs do. So I'm going to give you good grounding in that today and help dispel some of the myths and some of the problems with them as well. So the concept of OKRs is that the company sets the top level objectives often called the North Star, and then the team works together to decide how they can help contribute to that goal. Now, the magic of OKRs is that they give the team space to figure out how they'll achieve those goals. And each team is able to use their collective knowledge to indicate how they contribute to meeting the objectives, and it often performs in outperforming goals and spotting gaps that otherwise go unnoticed. I always think about it a little bit like that scene in Fellowship of the Ring. You know, when they're all looking at that huge task of getting to Mordor, you know, one of them says, you know, you can have my sword. And the other one says, you can have my bow. And the other one jumps in with, you can have my axe. They each looked around at what they could contribute at best and, and offered up what they could until all the gaps were filled and they had enough resources to set off on the journey and solve the problem at hand. 
Likewise, when you're setting a goal of, let's say, maximizing revenue from a market segment, your team is each stepping in with things like marketing, saying, we'll attract the right sorts of customers, and design saying, we'll make a delightful onboarding that converts and retains, and development saying, uh, we'll build a solid platform and deliver in a way that we can iterate often. Like no one person, no one team is responsible for the North Star by themselves, but together the whole team makes it happen. So OKRs allow the team to give directive on what the important objectives need to be met in order to be successful as a company and keep everyone pointing in the right direction and within reasonable guardrails. Now, objectives are meant to be high level and qualitative. You know, think of an objective as a goal that you want to achieve in the future. They set direction and provide motivation. It's helpful to ask the question, how do we know we're successful? What things should we see moving if we're doing a good job? And you probably want three to five objectives max per product team. And if you're just starting off on them, honestly, just start with one, like keep it really, really simple. Keep it super focused. Anything more than that, and you're not really giving instruction on what's successful because basically everything is. Now, OKRs usually have a time-based element to them too. So look for the top three things or the top thing that should move you in the right direction that would indicate success. Later on, you can switch them to new objectives. So I'm actually gonna share some story about how um, we started switching objectives and how that helped us move the needle on things. Now, these can be at the company level, these objectives or at the product level. And you know, if your company basically is a product, like ProdPad is, pretty much also the company, right? They might essentially be the same. If you are a product person in a wider company, there might be other objectives that are outside your remit, like say for the services side of the business. So just keep in mind that um, what you consider product objectives and company objectives may differ depending on the makeup of your business. And there might be objectives that are specific to your product or business type as well. Like I've seen a lot of different objectives from a lot of different companies. So here's some that you might see in the SaaS world. This is the world that I come from. These are some SaaS objectives. Here are some e-commerce objectives. If you're coming from the editorial world, you might have objectives like these. If you're coming from, uh, actually, these are some, uh, some really fun ones. Uh, we also use some of these here at ProdPad. They're called pirate objectives because they make the R noise uh, with the first letters of each word. But it's really looking at the customer journey funnel, you know, from when they're acquired as a user, activated into a paying customer, retained and renewed, how referrals to other customers are measured, and how revenue from the customers, such as upsells and downgrades, are measured. So often used with um, a wide variety of different companies out there. And there's a whole bunch of other generic objectives out there as well. It really just depends on what's core to the business and what the goals are. But the key thing is objectives are essential. You absolutely need these. If you're in a position to set objectives, make sure you're making time to set and communicate objectives. If you're in a position that lacks clear objectives, call this out. Point out that you can't effectively help the business hit your goals if you don't know what they are. And in addition to objectives, vision is essential too. Your team needs to understand which hill in the distance they're aiming for so they can aim vaguely in the right distance. Like what is your gold summit in the distance? If you don't have a clear product or a company vision, like stop here and make sure you get that sorted first. Now, this is a, uh, a vision template that you can use. You might actually recognize it from Jeffrey Moore's book, uh, Crossing the Chasm. It's uh, originally an elevator pitch template, but asks the same sort of questions that product vision statement should as well. Like who's the product for and what does it do and how does it uh, differentiate itself? So use this to sort of set the groundwork and work with your marketing team to jazz it up into something that you'd actually able to repeat and be proud to put on the wall and make sure that it is something that you and your team uh, behind are able to you know, understand and uh, see in the distance as well. So what do we have so far? We've got a vision, we've got objectives, and we've got a starting point, some visibility into the near term and the future time horizons. So we can start putting that together into a lean roadmap. Now, each of these blocks are a problem to be solved on the roadmap. You know, each of these is then linked to a specific objective. So each of those blocks there is what we'd call an initiative. The um, colored blocks is what we'd consider an objective. This is one popular configuration uh, that you might see a, a roadmap. This is another one that we see it in that's very similar, but it groups cards by objective. There's lots of different variations of these, but same sort of idea. So you can see roadmaps sort of taking different forms here. 
key thing is like, don't think too much about this at this point. Like your first roadmap is probably going to be wrong, you know, as is the way that you're measuring things and even what you're measuring. You know, frankly, you're still trying to get a handle on everything and that's okay. Like one of the best things you can do as a product person is to give yourself a bit of slack because frankly, the value in road mapping is not in the roadmap itself. It's in the process of road mapping, right? What you're doing here is you're laying out your assumptions into a prototype. You're having conversations around it and you're testing yourself against them, right? You're just laying out something really simple and just seeing what works, what doesn't work. Uh, you're not creating the most beautiful thing. You're just basically laying something out and seeing if you've got something there. Like this roadmap is a great start. And the thing is here is that we haven't actually done any work yet. We haven't actually started breaking down and building anything at this point in time. Everything we've talked about has ignored the whole process of how you actually go about building and developing. Now we're here at you know, Hands on Agile. It's an Agile focused event. So I hope none of this comes as a surprise. Like please for the love of all that is good, work in an Agile way. This sort of comes with the assumption that you're working in an Agile way. And I don't mean Agile with a capital A, I mean, you know, like not with the first four standups and, and special roles and hats and all that. I don't care about that. I mean, just to work in short, iterative bursts. You know, this road mapping technique is called a lean roadmap. It's designed around the idea of being lean, which at its core is basically that cycle of build, measure, and learn. And there's absolutely no point in building for weeks or months on end with no space for actually measuring and learning in between. You know, you can't be lean if you're not agile. You know, after all, it's not very lean if you iterate only every few months. You know, it's, you can only really be lean if you're iterating, you know, on a daily or weekly basis and you're actually spending the time learning and iterating in between. So all of this is predicated on the idea that you're taking on board the idea of agile and making space for that learning in your roadmap. And then this gives you all the room in the world to iterate and learn continuously, which means that your new road mapping OKRs are going to work really beautifully. And one of the reasons why I'm so lax on getting this roadmap and your process is perfect from the start is because I see processes in a similar way as I see products. It's something that you can measure and learn from and iterate upon to improve. You know, lots of companies mess up lots of facets of the process when trying to implement something new. And the ones who make it through the best are the ones who adapt and accept and, you know, uh, learn from, from past things. You know, teams and people are messy and there's never going to be a one size fits all solution. You know, so just as you run retros on your feature releases, run retros on your process changes. You know, just get used to this. Be ready to change when things don't feel right and tweak things to suit your team and you'll be right on the right track. So try out different OKR processes, try out different road mapping processes, retro them and improve on them. Now, we're not all the way through OKRs yet. We still have key results, which are the other half of OKRs. Now, key results are the specific metrics that you measure to ensure your work is having a positive impact. Now they stem from the objectives that you've identified and a key result is always measurable and must be quantitative. Now, really key thing here, key results are not just things that you just do. They're things that you can influence and they should be hard to hit. You know, even getting close to hitting a key result, it means that you should have made a significant change, something that's noticeable by others. You know, if you hit 70 to 80% of your key result target, you've done a good job. Like you should be making them tough. You should feel a little bit uncomfortable when you're looking at them. Because the whole point is, is that you're throwing a yardstick and saying, we think that we can go about that far. And you're using that yardstick to measure yourself by. The goal with OKRs isn't to give yourself a checklist of things to do and then just checking them off with boring predictability. It's to set challenges to pull your team's weight in the right direction. If you're setting them and hitting 100% of your key results, you're probably not setting them high enough and could be setting them higher in order to aspire towards a bigger challenge. But there's also another piece of OKRs that is missing here. And a lot of people don't talk about this because we talk, keep talking about these problems to solve that are on a roadmap. A term that you need to know in the OKR world is initiatives. And for some reason, it's like the forgotten middle child. I guess because Oikers doesn't have a good ring to it. An initiative describes the specific activities or projects that the team is working on to influence the success of an OKR. Now, even if you identify what you need to achieve, which is the objective based on the company strategy, and determine what good looks like, which is the key result, 
you're not going to get very far if you're unable to clearly communicate the actions you need to take in order to get there, which is the initiative. Now let's use this as an example. Like let's say you want to improve your overall health to avoid illness or injury. Now that's your objective. You might have a key result. So you're measuring progress by, let's say, lose 15 pounds by the end of the year. And you could have other measures of success as well, like captures other key results underneath that objective. Now for that one key result, you are not gonna just lose the weight by willing it away. You might set an initiative to introduce regular exercise to your schedule, so that's your initiative. Or to refactor your diet and start eating well. Now chances are you're gonna have to make progress on both of these initiatives to hit your goal. And within each initiative, there are a number of things you can try, all of which will take some time to see results from. So you can see how initiatives tie together the objectives and the key results. Now, for some reason, a lot of OKR systems miss initiatives and it leads to this OKR drift. It's what happens when you set up your objectives and key results in one place and then go off to do your day-to-day -day work in another place. What tends to happen is the OKRs get forgotten about and then the team goes back to update them at the end of the month and the OKRs just aren't as relevant anymore because the team has been learning and iterating in their product space and wasn't looking in their OKR tracking space. It's one of the reasons why OKRs often fail in teams. I regularly hear people saying things like, the OKRs don't represent the stuff I work on every day, or we move so fast the OKRs can't keep up. Well, oftentimes it's just because they're not keeping the OKRs in the place where they actually do their product work. Now, this is what it looks like when your OKRs are tied to your roadmap initiatives. And you've actually got that tight coupling between OKRs and initiatives. We're looking at a couple of key results for the objective engagement, and you can see how there's actually a few initiatives attached to each. It helps clarify how the team expects to reach those key results. And if any of those initiatives slipped, like you can see that some of those are now marked as next and later for things that are supposed to see results for the end of the year, then it's easy for them to flag up and say, hey, we might have a problem here. Are our priorities in order? Do we need to change the roadmap to make sure we're, we have a chance of hitting this key result or are we okay with this slipping? So spotting these things and having this conversation is the truly valuable part of the process. Now, OKRs are usually time-based, which a lot of people find weird because the roadmap is not, but it actually works out really well. See, with an OKR system, you're basically saying, here's what we think will make a difference to our company right now. So let's work together on maximizing those. Later, you'll find out that you have new objectives as you know, old problems are solved or become irrelevant. Now, usually you see OKRs managed on yearly or quarterly cadences. North Star objectives might be reviewed yearly as they're like big chunky goals that you're not likely to solve or need to change in the near term. And then objectives that lead into that North Star might need to be set quarterly. So keep this list small, like one is perfectly fine for a small team that needs that laser focus, three for most teams, or at most five if you've got a particularly complex team or product set up. Uh, and remember that these are per product and therefore per product team. So if you have multiple product teams, of course, you might have more objectives, but keep in mind that there's more management overhead. So making sure everyone knows the direction they're pointing and stays focused can be more difficult with uh, larger product portfolios. Now, here's an example of how uh, can help shape your roadmap uh, using some of our own OKRs. So with solid OKRs, these help shape your roadmap. This is why the lean roadmap sometimes gets called the objective-based roadmap. And this is where we all start seeing it come together. Our own North Star objective is to maximize revenue from customers who've been with us for 12 months or more. Now, this is something that we set a few years ago and we review yearly. It works well for us as we're a SaaS business with recurring revenues. And we see the value not just in the first sale, but in the ongoing retention of customers. And it's a sign that you've got something that people love if they buy it 12 times in a row and they keep going from there. So there's no shame in having your North Star objective be revenue focused. I mean, you're running a business after all and you need to be explicit about the goals. And we have other objectives around maintaining a happy and healthy team culture, but of course we can only do that if we're making enough money to pay everyone. So that's why the revenue one is our North Star. So the real magic is that it gives everyone on the team something to contribute to. No single person on the team can do this. It requires the skill of everyone, right? Like marketing needs to find leads, but not any leads. They need to find customers that are likely to find the product useful and stick around. Sales need to close sales, but they can't just do it by offering cheap discounts up front. They need to help us find sales or customers that are likely to stay on board for the entire 12 months or more. So they need to be able to show the customer the value and see why they should commit. 
And engineering can't just sit in the laurels either. Like their job is to create and maintain a product that's stable and fast enough to keep even advanced customers around for the long term. You know, our product and dev teams can't just design for the shiny onboarding entrance sequence. There's a lot of points along the customer journey that need to be considered to keep a, a customer for a year or more. So the North Star works because you can realistically see how it leads to the success of the company. So basically, we realized if we maximize for the revenue from the long-term customers, it's really hard to fail as a SaaS business because it's always going to lead to that um, long-term customer revenue and always going to lead to that success. So the North Star, you know, as we say, it illuminates that gold-topped mountain in the distance. Now, it's not always been a smooth journey to that top of the mountain. Along the way, you run into obstacles and you learn things. So these should shape your objectives. In our case, we've had a couple of pivotal moments where focusing on one objective really saved our hide. I recall a time several years ago when we'd redone the app in new tech rather than the jQuery junk that I'd built it in some years ago. Now, the new version looked better and had richer functionality, but our increasingly advanced users were happy with the new functionality and the new version, but the onboarding stopped working as well because we hadn't built it for new users. So our numbers flatlined, right? We were getting new growth, which was scary for a team with growing costs. And so our ultimate goal was to maximize revenue from long-term clients. We would have no cohort of new clients in 12 months if we didn't fix onboarding now. So we set a quarterly objective to increase the conversion rate from free to paid in the onboarding flow. And so this in turn triggered us to clear space in our roadmap. And so this is how it all comes together. You know, after all, the main objective for the quarter was conversion rate. And so only initiatives that helped conversion rate should be worked on in the foreseeable future. So everything else was pushed into the side. Now going into it, we didn't know what sort of things we were going to do. We had to work together to research and discover problems and figure out how to solve them over the course of that quarter. And sure enough, we came up with a bunch of potential reasons the onboarding was wrong. We tried a ton of things to fix it. Now, some things worked, some things didn't. None of these things had deadlines. They were all completed in the time it took them to, right? To the level of completion needed to make sure that they worked and were stable. You know, we didn't go into the quarter saying, we'll deliver a new onboarding experience by the end of the quarter. We went into the, the quarter saying, Onboarding is our biggest opportunity right now. We'll just do as much as we can to impact that area with the goal of increasing this conversion number. If we'd tried to specify the onboarding project up front and guess how long it would take, we wouldn't have had the chance to do all the onboarding experiment we did that quarter. We would have ended up simply building out some of the ideas we thought were good at the time, but you know, not end up actually building the best ones. As it turns out, some of the best initiatives happened to come up late in the quarter after a whole bunch of discovery and tests and failures. You know, we made no headway for a while. We tested, you know, this stuff and that and failed a bunch, constantly learning about what was working. And as we learned more, we got better at spotting opportunities. And towards the end of the quarter, we hit on a couple ideas that ended up making the difference. And so towards the end of the quarter, we ended up having to make a call. You know, were objectives still the thing we wanted to focus on? And we ended up making such good headway on it that we ended up extending our focus for another month, giving us another time to squeeze out the end of the, uh, the few more experiments. And so in four months time, we quadrupled our onboarding conversion rate just by having that focus. So basically we got to the point where we met our conversion objective and were able to then change the focus. So there comes a time when you need to change that focus. Now, it might be at the end of a quarter, which is pretty typical for OKRs, but it's an arbitrary time period. Like, so remember, be conscientious when cutting off work that's in flow. Like, you can change the focus whenever. And so we changed it midway through the quarter and basically said, we're going to now change to retain and upsell, right? We've now got this group of people who've come in. Let's change to these new objectives and allowed us to trigger a, a new update in our roadmap to focus on retention and upselling and allowed us to push forward through to new objectives over time as well. So key thing here is that you can use your roadmap to react to changes in the market. It's meant to be a flexible roadmap that is adaptive to the different problems that are out there and allows you to keep your team pointed at what's important and allows you to solve problems over the course of the time. Now, good objectives should leave room for interpretation. 
if you think about it this way, like we weren't picky about how we got the onboarding conversion rate up. It just needed to be done. We weren't picky around the method of which experiment was going to be done. We weren't picky around how long it was going to take. We just said, let's push everything aside and make room for it. If someone had said, make the onboarding flow better, you can imagine the team getting lost in perfecting the in-app experience and not daring to look around and find some of these other experiments that we found along the way. It's a little bit like if you'd landed on a new shore and the team were tasked with finding new food for the night. Now, if you just gave them the task of finding food for the night, that's probably achievable. You know, maybe they go hunting, maybe they go foraging, maybe they set up traps. As long as you're not picky, they all get fed. If you're the leader of a journeying crew, the objective was to get a steak dinner, the team would likely have missed great opportunities for other edible options and everyone would have gone hungry. You know, this is one of the big gotchas of OKRs or frankly of an objective system. And it's what went wrong with KPIs. It just becomes this tool to micromanage with rather than a way to set goals for what the business needs. So really importantly is to use OKRs to create the space Use OKRs and roadmaps together to create the space for your team to find the best path forward and to clear out the space to react to different changes as you see them come through. Other thing that I want to put forward is the idea that uh, a habit that I see all the time, a bad habit, is that uh, teams often trash their roadmap. They release something, so they close all the tickets in Jira, they crumple up all the sticky notes on the wall, and then they move on to the next thing. And it might seem good for keeping up cadence, but it's bad for ensuring that they're actually making an impact. You know, after all, just because something was launched doesn't mean that they've actually solved the problem they wanted it to. So you can use the roadmap to build in space for validation. You know, you don't want to just take something off the roadmap and say it's done and move on to the next thing. Just because something has been finished doesn't mean that it's actually been completed. So you can actually move things from your roadmap into what we call a completed roadmap or a validation roadmap, a validation space. The whole purpose here is to give you a space to track what was released and when, and then outline the results. You know, did it solve the problem and then move the metric you were hoping it would? So by building this validation into your roadmap, you create a space to show the value of the work done. So the value of this roadmap format paired with objectives is that it takes the focus off building features and hitting delivery dates and helps your team strive towards solving problems. So using OKRs and roadmaps together really helps you solve problems as a team, gives you the autonomy, and essentially helps your team deliver more together. Now, with that, I want to say thanks very much. So if you are really interested in lean roadmapping and how this works, um, reach out to Jana, have a look at PodPad, give it a try. It's an excellent application. I totally like it. And yeah, Jana, thank you so much for spending your, your evening with us here. Of course. Thank you for the invite.